I'm here to bring just a word this morning to kind of give you a large 30,000 foot level view of what's going on around here. What's going on around us? What's going on in the world? What's God doing? So think this through with me. Genesis, let's go back just to the very first part of the book, right? Genesis, the fall of human beings. They mess up. And God does what? Throws them on the ash heap and says, let's start over? No, what does he do? He finds them. He goes after them. He seeks them. So here's my thesis. God is the first missionary. Starting in Genesis, he's on mission. All the way through the prophets, all the characters, if you look through carefully, the whole thing is God's on a mission. High point, of course, is that Jesus, God's own son, goes to the cross, suffers and dies, rises again, Easter, amen? Then he's ascended, and they're all bummed out because we really want more of Jesus. He said, no, it's good that I go so that you get the comforter of the Holy Spirit so we can do this stuff kingdom worldwide. Right? So then the book of Acts takes off. Now the mission is taken on a whole new gas because you have the Holy Spirit filling these folks, and off it goes. Right? And it goes all the way to the mission is the grand story. And, and before he rose again, his last parting words, Jesus, to the disciples was this, Matthew 28. And check it out here on the screen. Jesus said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teach them to what? To obey everything I've commanded you and surely I'm with you always the good news is I'm with you always when to the end of the age right so that charge was given to these 12 actually 11 at that point right one didn't work out we sow into leaders every now and then one bounces out but the 11 we get the 12th one eventually right we get back on track, but that charge was to 12. We're his disciples, so the disciples charge the disciples, go make disciples, so that's still for us. What's the first thing I noticed when I walked in here was that wall, what does it say? Hope Community does what? I was like, yes, this is my church. I can, I can work with this one, right? Because they're all making disciples. How many churches do I go into? They're all about living in the past and celebrating history and you know, I mean, I don't know what all they do. They huddle and cuddle. I am not interested in churches that huddle and cuddle. Yeah, you guys are gonna love each other, gonna hug, I get that, that's great, that's community, that's fellowship. But that's not the point. The point is the expansion of the kingdom. That lost people might be found, because guess what? I was lost, so were you, right? And Pico has a lot of lost people. I don't know what the demographics are. Sometimes I figure that out before I didn't get to do that this time. But, you know, whatever it is, what I do know is this. You have at least one in two, at least five out of ten, at least 50 out of 100 people that drive by this church every moment have no faith commitment whatsoever. Zero. And the mission is to be out there loving them in, showing them the kingdom, and then we're going to fill up the baptistry week after week and we're gonna dunk them and send them. Can I say it that way, right? That's the mission. You guys, where do you guys do the baptisms around here? We're working on that, it's all right. Amen, it's on order, amen. That's the mission. And he's chosen his people to be on mission so that those who are not his people will be his people, right? And so Jesus said this, for the last 2,000 years, this has been the mission. And here's what he said. Here's the promise. Check this out. This is Matthew 16, 18. And I'll tell you, Peter, that on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of what? Hades will not overcome. There are setbacks. There are problems. There are challenges. Amen. Yes, that happens. But the overall picture is, go to the back of the book, who wins? Jesus. The church prevails. And so that's the hope we, look, we live in. Revelation 7, 9, and, and so forth. 7, 9, check this out. After I looked, and therefore was a great multitude that no one could count, 
from every nation, every tribe, people, language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, white robes holding palm branches, and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Angel fans, Dodger fans, all together, it's gonna be okay. Oh, did I step on toes now? Every nation, every tribe, every tongue. That's the end of the book. That's the story. The gates of hell will not prevail. So Jesus is saying this to us. That's the mission, but you gotta get powered up, plugged in before you go. So Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Let's retranslate. You'll be my witnesses to Pico Rivera, the greater LA area, and to the ends of the earth. That's our mission. And anything else is a deviation from the mission. So I was sharing the story, one of the things, so if, you, if the Holy Spirit has been given to you, you've been filled with the Spirit because you're saved people, and he wants to fall on you to anoint you for ministry, this, this is everywhere. So one of the challenges I'm trying to live into is, is to live into, like, actually praying for people and even suggesting, can I pray for people? See, it's one thing when you hear somebody say, hey, would you pray for me? And, and I always go, yeah, yeah, I'll get to that, which means I'll never do that, right? I mean, let's be honest, because I don't put it in my calendar. If it's not my phone, it ain't gonna happen. So I'm trying to say, well, let's pray right now, but here's the next level of mission. So what happens if you go to a restaurant this afternoon and after we're having the chips and the salsa and they're about to bring the, and you can say, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bless this food in a minute. I'm gonna ask the Lord to bless by the way, is there anything I can pray for you about? Nine out of 10 waiters and waitresses kind of are taken aback, and then they go, well, well, actually, and then uncle so-and-so, or I got this test, or my car is, you know, right? And then you pray for them. And then it gets more scary, because here's what you gotta do. You have to go back the next week and say, so what did he do? Oh. What my thesis, and the more I hang around missionaries, is this. God loves to show off to unchurched people. So if we've been delegated the authority to go make disciples, and if I'm reading my scripture right, do the stuff, then let's go do the stuff. Let's go pray for people. Let's go kick out demons. Let's go make disciples. And, and I know I've talked to people who know some pastors who've raised the dead. I'm like, that's, that's way bigger than me. But that's the stuff it says. We either believe it or we don't. My colleague this week just was weeping. He's been praying. He's, he intercedes four and five hours a day. That's his ministry, is praying for leaders. And he enters. He's now on my team. I'm getting some of that. Right? I'm excited about that. He's praying for me. And he's saying that, that, that the, we as the American church, we don't believe the Bible anymore. I was like, that's harsh. And I realized he's right. Because somehow we still read that stuff about going and making disciples and praying for people and, and healing the sick and raising the dead and kicking out demons. And we go, well, that was for another time. They don't really mean that, blah, blah, blah. But now that I hang around in a missions organization, see, I'm hearing stories around the world of that stuff happening. And now I'm like, God, I want that in my world. Because I'm tired of boring church, Right? You guys aren't a boring church, but I mean, just as the church, like, let's not do boring church. Let's do kingdom. Because, by the way, the world is dying for us to get up and get off and get out there because they're going to die a Christless eternity if we don't live into the mission. And now I'm like, not on my watch, <laughs> not on pastor's watch, right? No more of that stuff. And what's fun to hear is, though the gospel has fits and starts in various places, and it comes and goes in certain Ground swells right now, Latin America, Asia. I've been to Seoul, Korea. Half the country is Christian. 60 years ago, it was wiped out, zeroed out from the war, and, and mostly Buddhist and other stuff. Now one in two South Koreans love Jesus. And in the evenings when all the lights turn on and, and you look in the skyline, you see red, because every church puts a red cross 
on their church, and the whole skyline is churches. Now, I can show you churches and skylines in Scotland and places in Europe where every church has 20 people. But in Korea, they're full, busting out. I went to a Friday night prayer service, the largest church in the world. Do you know how many people are in the largest church in the world? Any idea? What do you think? 50,000? Bigger, go, bigger. Five, how much? Bigger. Biggest church in the world. How many members do they have? 120, what? They got a million people. Million people in one church. One church. They have 25 services throughout the week. Because you go on Tuesday at 4 o'clock, you go Wednesday at 6 o'clock, right? Everybody has a different time. And I went to the Friday night prayer service. There were 15,000 people praying on Friday night. College, young adults. I was like sitting next to them like, why are you here? Like, don't you have somewhere else to be on Friday night? That's what they said. They're like, I would rather, this is, this is where it's at. And it's nothing like being in a, in a South Korean church when all of a sudden the band stops and something happens. They say something. I don't know when it is, but they said something. And everybody stood up and started praying out loud to the king. And the volume goes from like 90 decibels to about 105. And they pray for half an hour. And they're praying for salvation of their people and they're praying for the reunification of the North Korean, South Korean peninsula. And, I'm like, and I've been like, yeah, that's never gonna happen. I don't know if this, I don't know. But I'm just saying that in parts of the world, the gospel is flowing fast. Right now in China, in underground churches, in 15 years, secular people who study people growth and populations and all of that, saying to us, that within 15 years, China will be the largest Christian nation in the world in terms of number of believers. So we're gonna start getting like textbooks on how to do church from Chinese underground churches. Get ready for it. What's also fascinating to me is I'm trying to be a missiologist now. Like how does the gospel work in different cultures is that they don't have cool bands like this. They don't have really cool lights like this. They don't even have Bible schools or seminaries or even pews or carpets or microphones or Gibson guitars. Where's my Gibson playing brother? Where'd he go? Yeah, dude. I got so stoked when I see you get a Les Paul. I'm like, this is gonna be a good morning. But they got none of that stuff. They just have scripture. They love on each other. They make disciples. They mentor each other. And they multiply small groups. And they do it over and over and over. And they replicate and they're about to take over the world in terms of more Christians than anywhere in the world. Wow. I want to get in on that stuff. I'm trying to figure that stuff out and bring it back here. What can we learn, right? Because it's happening out there, and it's really exciting. At the same time, there are some of us, and, and in history past, we've been sowing and sowing and sowing, and it feels like a brick wall. Adoniram Judson, famous missionary, he went away in 1812, sails to, to, to Burma, which is now Myanmar. No followers of Jesus there. They don't even have the Bible in their language. And he goes, feels called to go to the ends of the earth. That's what he read. That's what he feels called. Goes there, spends 15 years. He gets beat up, shackled, jailed, loses his wife, goes into full-on funky depression for, for years, gets sustained again in Jesus, gets fired up, learns their language, starts translating their Bible. After 15 years of work, he's only got 10 or 12 disciples and no church. Now, as I said, first service, if I got that mission report, I'd be like, eh, this one's not worth it. Pull them out, right? Get the 747, come on back, we'll try something else. I would have said that. But now, over half a million people know Jesus because he translated the Bible into their language and they all tie their salvation back to that one brother. So I've sat back and thought, you know, I'm all about big and quick and replicating, but I have to also realize in God's economy, it's different than the way I look at things. And some things, it's an immediate work, and other things, there's a slower, you pour in, you sow behind the scenes, and then down the road, the fruit happens. And I don't know when the difference is, so that's a, that's a Jesus thing. That's beyond my pay grade. 
But I do know that for some of you, you are praying and sowing into ministry, into people, into family, into colleagues, and so forth, and it just feels like nothing is happening. But God is still at work. He's still at work. So keep going. And you may never see at the end of the day all that you sowed and what happened. Some of those folks, like you said, who poured into this church, who've gone to glory, haven't seen you yet. But when you get there, they can say, ah, oh, part of my tithes and offerings and energy, look what the fruit was. And that's gonna be a glorious day. Now on the flip side, you know, I've been to churches, one in particular, not too far from here, where the young pastor, this is 20 years ago, we, uh, we, I go to see what's going on in his church and they have just finished this beautiful parlor room, oh, a little bit, about the, half the size of this room. And it, it was decorated, y'all been to, um, I say y'all because I live in Texas now, so it just kind of comes out. <laughs> but, but they basically, they had, it's like, you ever been to, to what's that spaghetti, spaghetti factory? You ever been to spaghetti factory, right? It's like 1920s kind of vibe. Lots of velour, lots of, velvet, you know, and little dingles and all that stuff hanging. So, so they decorated this entire parlor as if it's 1928. They spent $90,000 20 years ago. So what's that in today's dollars? Right? What is that? 200,000, 180,50, I mean a lot of money. And my friend who did a funeral for somebody big in the city, there were so many people, they had to open up the parlor because the fellowship hall ran out of space. And people walked into the parlor. And my buddy was called on the carpet the next day. How dare you let people go in the parlor? Because that, in effect, was a museum to yesteryear. And I think about the money wasted on history and memorabilia for no purpose. No wonder the unchurched often think the church is just about themselves, doesn't care about the lost or the hurting or the broken, and we spend money for rooms that we don't go in. Are you like, are you kidding me? You guys would never do that. But I tell that story because it, it just rattles around of like there are so many churches that just get caught on the wrong stuff. Living in yesteryear, living, the Bible says that God says, forget what's going on, I'm doing a new thing right? He's always doing something new. And the haunting question, Pastor, is what is he doing today that's new that you and I are missing because we're trapped in the way we're used to it? And I always have to ask, that's going to be really obvious later, but right now I'm not seeing it. And that scares me because God's always doing something new because he's on mission. He's always on mission. This church I know cares about the lost. As your pastor showing me what you guys are doing to love this city, I'm like, yes, yes, yes. And then my challenge is to push you a little further. Okay, so the time has come, he said in Mark 1, 15, the kingdom of God has come. That's when Jesus is saying, the kingdom is represented in me. And then the rest of that chapter is descriptions of him going around doing the kingdom stuff. It's a description of what the kingdom looks like. So repent, get in the kingdom, and the challenge is now go do this stuff. But here's the challenge. It's not necessarily on this campus. It's out there. Remember, they're not looking for a good church. So we gotta go be the church out there. We call it the church gathered and the church scattered. Scattered on mission. So what happens is you gather here like in a football huddle to get pumped up, get the play, Right? And then we get sent to do the job, to do, you know, and there's going to be rough and tumble. Some are going to fall down. We're going to pick each other up. We're going to play the game. Next week, come back. We huddle again. Not to huddle and cuddle, to hide out. I'm tired of huddling and cuddling churches. Oh, those people, they're so bad. We're going to get infected. Are you kidding me? Okay, yes, if you just got sober two weeks ago, you cannot go back to the bar yet. No. You get it? I'm not talking about like doing stupid stuff. You get it? You understand what I'm saying? Okay, so don't hear what I'm not saying. But I am saying. But the point is to live on kingdom mission out there. Because they're not coming here. They're not looking for a good church. Now when they get here, they're going to be like, this is a great church. 
But there's a lot of steps between your office mates, your colleagues, your friends, your parents, your soccer coaches, all that to get them to hear. There's a lot of steps in this world. So go live on mission. And if I can get even nastier, because I'm going to drive away in a minute, I'm challenging pastors to deprogram your church so we have more time for mission. See, what's happening is a lot of pastors think we're on a cruise ship and I got to entertain you every night of the week. I'm Julie McCoy. Remember that? You all know what I'm talking about? You know, because you wear the bell bottoms. I get it. I was there. I was there. We think we're cruise directors. We're entertaining Christians. Every got to have a program every night of the week. And I'm saying deprogram, teach them how to be on mission, and then validate when they're out there with their lost friends, that's mission. We're huddling to send. Is this making sense? And a lot of churches I work with, they're stuck, if you will. We come in and do that strategic planning stuff. They're stuck because they got so many programs, and pastors are running around just trying to make stuff happen to entertain overchurched people who already believe and are getting fat just sitting around and sucking it up. We still friends? You get what I'm saying? The mission is out there. The mission is out there. There's a church I'm working with in Mesquite, uh, Texas, just outside of Dallas. I worked with them for two years. I went in, did our missional pathway process, four workshops, led them all through. They got their personal mission. They got their corporate mission. They're living. So what they decided at the end of the day was they had a number of people living in a district called the 805. That's not a beer. It's, it's a district. Right, it's a, it's a county district. What they found is when they interviewed community leaders about the needs, they figured out a bunch of our people live in this area. Turns out one of the, the local city congress type, you know, congress, what do you get, not congress, city, um, city council said, wow, there's a lot of issues there. And they became a person of peace that opened up doors for this church to suddenly start doing ministry. So they decided, we're going to do code enforcement in the 805. When I first heard him say that, I'm like, you're going to go ticket people? Like, right? Like, what's that about? Well, that's loving. <laughs> Busted. You know, here's your ticket, right? No, no, no. What they were going to do is, and they did, and they're doing, is they set up a tent every Saturday afternoon in the middle of that four blocks. And they feed the people every week. They have a big party. They have hot dogs, all kinds of stuff. They play broom ball with the kids and soccer with the kids in the street. Meanwhile, the adults are going around and saying, hey, I noticed that your front gate is busted, and, and that's actually a code violation. We don't want you to get busted, so we're going to fix it, okay? And then people go, you're going to what? What do you want? Nothing. We're just going to love you. We want to fix We want to, we're, We love this neighborhood. Who are you guys? Well, we're part of this church, but we're just here for you. Now, did they wear T-shirts that said, come to church on Sunday? No. Did they pass out flyers that are like, here's our men's group? No. Did they pass out cart? No. They just loved them. They just loved them. Every week, they're still doing this. They're fixing up the neighborhood. People are starting to talk. People are coming out for the hot dogs. People are starting to trust these people. Now there's conversations about why are you doing this? Oh, this is stuff that Jesus does. Wow. Now they're starting to pray for the people in the houses. So now you're having spiritual conversations, healings, all kinds of stuff starting to take place. Kingdoms showing up. People start coming to church. They're making disciples of lost people in their city. That's just one church doing missional pathway out their ministry. Some churches adopt schools. Some adopt the firehouse. Some adopt the city council, whatever it is. That's one of our jobs to help a church figure out who are you. But here's the key. It's not a one-off. It's not a one-time thing. It's the same people. I see you every week. I, I call life on life like this. <laughs> not what typical churches do is, well, you know, let's do, let's go help the homeless in Santa Ana. Let's all get in our cars and, and we'll pack a bunch of sandwiches and we'll drive down and then we'll roll up and then we'll roll the window down, boop, right? And we'll hand them out and go, oh, bless you. Boop, roll it back up, drive back to Pico and go, man, we served. That's called a gesture. That's not committed action, and that's not the mission. You're never going to see them again. They don't know who you are. Nothing. That's just so we feel good. We still, we all right? You get it? We love to gesture. We don't know how to do committed action. So, Pico, 
what needs are we going to meet out there repeatedly so we can do the stuff, so that people can be found, so we can make disciples, okay? I'm going to leave you with one last challenge, one last story. And it ministers to me, and it just shows you the power of the kingdom. So I come from a town called Fullerton, not too far away. That's where I was for the last almost 20 years. And there's an airstrip in that town, little, uh, little airport, local airport, no jets, just small plane stuff. And I would drive by it a lot, and this story emerges from that airstrip. Because back in the 50s, there was the training base for Mission Aviation Fellowship, which is an organization that trains pilots and sends them into unreached people group places where there are no airstrips, there are no runways, there, there are people who are not even connected to the Western world for that matter. So back in the 50s, this one tribe in Ecuador, the Wodani tribe, was on the heart of this one team. And it was led by Nate Saint. And Jim Elliott, which might be a name some of you know, was on that team. And they went and they made contact with the Wodani. Wodani were a bloodthirsty tribe, headhunting, warring, nasty, bloody, kill each other tribe. They made contact in their little yellow airplane, circled around, sent materials and some food and stuff down a bucket while they're making a circle. That makes me airsick thinking about it. But they made contact. They welcomed them down. They landed the plane. They made contact. And then all five were killed by spears. It was a big deal. Life magazine, Time magazine. It was like a national story from Fullerton, California. Jim Elliott, who's written some things, and his journals are famous. His wife comes out of all that experience. So here on the screen is a picture of the young man who led that team. I think there's a picture of him. Yeah, they're looking for it, yeah. But there you go. Okay, so that's Nate. That's like 1950-something or other. That's the yellow plane. Okay, so now he's gone. Team is dead. So his sister goes down there anyway, lives in the village, disciples them, and 20 years later, they're all followers of Jesus. So now, son of Nate is Steve. Steve is called down to his aunt's funeral, goes down, and as he kind of comes back into contact with these people, he lives the story all over again. I mean, he's in the jungle. It's like this is where it happened. An elderly gentleman named Minkayani said, I want to take you somewhere, show you something. So he's a follower of Jesus, and he takes uh, Steve out. They get on the riverbed. They get out there. They find the plane that's still there. Pieces of it still in the jungle. And Minkayani says, um, I'm the one who killed your father. And as I'm trying to figure out how this works in the story, but somewhere he had a ceremonial or had somewhere already pre-planted that there was a spear, and he handed it to Steve. And he said, avenge your father. Kill me. You have every right and just like a Hollywood movie, he knocked him down, stood on him, and had the spear at his throat. Like it was, he was this far from ending it for this guy. And then tears filled his eyes, and he realized, my father who was in Jesus gave his life, and now you all are followers of Jesus. And he stood up, and they embraced, and they cried like babies. And now Steve and Minkayani are brothers, and Minkayani this gentleman is like the father and the grandfather to the whole village where they didn't have anybody doing that because they were all killing each other. But because of Jesus, whole communities transformed. I leave you with that because it still rocks. Every time I drive by the Fullerton Airport, I think of this story. I can't help it. And I think about where else in the world do you have that kind of forgiveness? If there was anything better, I'd sign up for that. But this is as good as it gets. And that kind of forgiveness is only found at the cross. Friends, we are in the real deal, the forgiveness, kingdom-making, transforming, life-changing, people development business for now and for eternity. Because what happens now in the character that God forms in you now carries on. Because you're going to reign, it says. 
This is all, I heard somebody say, this is training for raining. That's not my phrase. It's pretty good, though. You can have it. <laughs> right? We're training for raining. Right? So that's what this is all about. And it's my privilege just to encourage you, to partner with you. I'm going to hang out some more with your pastors. Thanks for letting me be here. Thanks for being a supporting church. Thanks for praying for me. I'm off to Guatemala tonight. As you know, that part of the world got socked with a, with a major volcano. I think we're going to be flying right around that thing. And we're going to be on a different part of the country in one of the poorest, most emaciated parts of the country out there. We'll be holding babies that have been malnourished. We're going to be right in the middle of it, training pastors to, set, to reach these villages for Jesus. So thank you for your prayers and support for me, and thanks for the kingdom work you do. So God bless you, and go in peace. So, um... I've got, I've got a lot to say in just a little bit of time, but I, I do want to uh, point out, I don't know if you caught that, because uh, Kirk thanked you. And Kirk is one of the missionary uh, givings that we give. Uh, we started telling you uh, at the beginning of the year of some of the ministries that we fund. And so these pastors, are they just, they don't know. And they're trying, but they have such a limited amount of teachings. And Kirk comes in there and just from his, you know, 20 years plus experience is just, they just eat this up. And they are able to pass. I remember when, when uh, one of the first conferences I went to was John Maxwell's conference. And it wasn't a coincidence that I was there. I was like, oh, my goodness. You know, I was like, I was like, oh my goodness, I know nothing. I have no idea what I'm doing. I knew I was so out of my element. And he just poured into me. Well, that's what Kirk is doing. And you and we together are sending him out. We let me tell you what, this church is doing incredible things. All right. So I want to say that first. The other thing I want to do is come on up front is I've been saying this for a while, but the Holy Spirit is just um, teaching me to teach you that you are a leader. Somebody say, I'm a leader. I say, but Pastor, I don't feel like a leader. No, 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 understand, you have been strategically placed. I'll come on over here and brag about Pastor George for a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Pastor George inspires me. And I'm not talking about the inspiration that he is when I come to Esperanza. He is inspiring with his wife at Esperanza. I see how much he loves his congregation, and that's inspiring, and that's great. But I'm not going to talk to you about that. I'm going to talk to you about the mission that he's on. Pastor George works a full-time job. God has, I believe, totally supernaturally just blessed him and blessed him and blessed him. And he's got a great job. And, uh, but, and I don't know all the details, uh, but I know that he goes early with his Bible and he prays. And, and he's not praying to say, oh, look at me. Well, look at me. I'm No, no, that, that's not what he's doing. But he is a witness at his place. And uh, just recently, and, and you probably don't even know this, but, but uh, Dave shared this with me. And he said, one of the supervisors, I don't know his name to protect the innocent, but I don't know his name anyway, or the guilty. But he said, this guy was just not a good supervisor. You know, filthy language and, and just, just yelling all the time. It's very harsh. And he said, uh, through Pastor George, this guy got saved. And Dave told me, he said, and, and let me tell you what, the cussing stopped like immediately. He's like so nice and it's like, it's so great. There's a lot of other things that are taking place at Pastor George's work. But here's what I'm telling you. Pastor George is on mission. 
So he goes to work understanding God has placed me in this specific place. He, he sees himself, I am a leader. I'm, I'm the man that God has ordained and placed me there. Here's what I'm saying to you. See yourself in that leadership role because where is Jesus? Has anybody noticed Jesus isn't here anymore? Has anybody noticed that? Jesus is gone. He's not here. Now he's at the right hand of the Father. He is interceding for Pastor George. And he's interceding for you that you would be a witness in the people that you are around. I know that the Holy Spirit is raising people up. And you might not have been that person for a long, long, long time. You can't go back to high school. Sorry, you can't. But we still have some time, day left. We still have opportunity. So I believe God is calling you at your, at your college you're going to, or at your workplace, or at the bank, or at the car wash, or, or at the grocery store. But we need to get on mission, amen? Or, or, or around your family. Oh, Pastor, my, my family thinks I'm crazy. I know, so it is mine, amen? But I'm telling you, you just hang in there because they'll be hurting. And when they're hurting, they're going to come to you. Amen. If you feel like, you know what, you say, Pastor, God has read my mail today. God has been speaking to me and saying, I need to be a bold. I need to be more bold in my leadership. I need to be more out there. I need to be more outspoken. Somebody says, yeah, yeah but your, your biggest testimony, you know what, is is your life. I agree 100%, but part of your life is your words. Amen? From the heart, the mouth speaks. I told the first congregation, how many, how many think you've heard over 20 sermons here at this church? How many heard over 50? How many heard over 100? How many heard over 100? How many, how many believe most of those were good sermons? Somebody, come on, somebody say amen to that. Little, little coerced, but it'll still work. But here's my point. Listen to me. Here's my point. My point is, what, what is God, why, why are you hearing those messages? Here's why. Because they're changing you. The Word of God is powerful. It's re, you're, you're, conf, you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. You're looking a little bit more like Jesus every single time you come in and allow the Word to affect your life. What are you doing that for? So you can so you can listen to you know what uh, you know I don't know some praise music instead of Def Leppard, is that the is that the is that the purpose? Some of you younger people, Def Leppard, what's that? Don't look it up on the internet. You just waste of time. Here's what I'm saying. Here's what I am saying. That the purpose of that is for you to look more like Jesus that you can introduce Jesus to your friends around you. That's the purpose. I don't know who God's speaking to, but and I don't want you to feel any obligation. But if you feel like, gosh, Pastor, I feel so, I am the leader and I will lead. And I want you to pray with me today because I will lead and I'm gonna be more bold than I've ever been before. If someone believes that Kirk didn't come with a good message, he came with a God message today. I want you to stand up at your feet. I want you to say, Pastor, I want you. I don't want anybody feel obligated. But if you feel like I'm going to be a leader, I'm going to lead. I'm not waiting for my husband. I'm not waiting for my wife. I'm not waiting for my pastor. I'm not waiting for Tamara to talk to my friends. I'm going to talk to my friends. If you feel like that's you, I want you to stand up. I want to pray with you.
I'm telling you what, I've, I've been praying for you. God has told me and showed me that there's all kinds of leaders in this church that are gonna start to be the leaders. And Tamara, all, and all you're gonna do is just keep on coming back in here. And all I'm gonna do is just throw a bunch of, uh, you know what, gasoline on the fire. There's, listen to me. Everybody look at, look, look at Ernie for a minute. There is a fire that God is burning inside of you. And all this gasoline that have been poured on you through the word, through the word of the word. Guys, you, listen, you don't, listen to me somebody. You don't need more training. Keep on standing and, and, and don't lose me on this. When I was a young man and my father had preached to me and preached to me and preached to me and preached to me and preached to me, preached to me I, was, I had a drug problem when I was growing up. My parents used to drag me to church all the time. They dragged me to church and drug me to church. And you know what? Half the time, I thought I wasn't listening. But in Newport Beach, sitting on that beach, when my 20-year-old friend, Bill Bear, started asking me about God, rivers of life flew out of my mouth. And it was like I was having that out-of-body experience. I'm, I'm telling you, it was like, oh my goodness, this guy is good. And I knew I couldn't take any credit for that. I knew it was the rivers of life that had been poured into me for years from my dad. And it was in there. And when Bill asked, boom, it just came out. And I thought, what in the world is going on here? Ernie, let me tell you what. You are not here on accident. God has got a mighty work for you to do. I can't give you details, but I'm telling you, you are going to minister to people. You know what? You are, you, ha you have a people like you automatically. That is, that is a gifting from God. You are an incredible leader and you have been trained. You don't need, I'm not saying that you don't need more training. I'm saying that the training that you have received is plenty for what, what you need to do this week and this month and even this year. Now, I'm speaking to Ernie, but the truth is I could, be, I could, I could say the exact, and it doesn't take away, Ernie, it doesn't take away what I'm telling you. I could say the exact same thing to you. And if you're standing... You're not standing on accident. You're standing on purpose. God is speaking to you. And God is speaking to you. And God is speaking to you. And God is speaking to you. God is speaking to you. God is speaking to you. And he's saying, be the leader that I called you to be. Because I put you in that position on purpose. And there's no insufficiency in me. And I am in you. So walk in that sufficiency. Oh yeah, I'm going to pray with you. Father. Father, I thank you for these that are standing I thank you for their willingness to stand and say, God, use me. Father, I pray that we would be completely dependent upon you, that we would recognize it is through you that we are living and moving and have our being. Father, I pray just like, just like Pastor George is being used in a gracious way in his work, may that that anointing just rub all off on us. May we recognize we are that, that the main ministry that needs to take place in this church is outside of the walls of this church. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen. You may be seated. <laughs> proud of you guys. I'm so proud of you. 
I'm, um, I'm sure that as individuals, we will begin to walk in a greater area of making disciples as much as we're going to also corporately as a church begin to walk. And uh, we've pushed ourselves this past six months doing different <coughs> things that we've never done before being out in our community. But um, Pastor Kirk, as you just share, it just it just is exactly where God has been leading us. And uh, Pastor Drew and I will just be seeking the Lord. How do we do this more corporately as a congregation? More than what we're already doing. More than the drive through prayer. More than being out there and inviting on Saturdays. But um, we, will, we will hear the voice of the Lord. And then we will need to come together collectively as a body to be able to fulfill what he's asking us to do. So there's individual... There's an individual um, mission that we need to pick up in our daily life as we go, each one of us. But then there will be a church corporate movement that we will do as a church. Does that make sense? Just, you know what, um, I, I became a little bit uh, convicted when you talked about South Korea and praying that they would, you know, unite with the North Koreans. And, you know... We, you know, you said, well, really? You know what I mean? So we all kind of think like, huh? But can I tell you something? There would have been no wall of Jericho come down without a Joshua and a Caleb to lead it. You know what? There would have been no Goliath taken down, you know what, without a David to lead it. And, and so shame on us for not knowing who our God is because our God is amazing. And he will do amazing things through people, his people. But it takes his people to believe that and to be looking towards him and hearing his voice for our marching orders. And that's what we're going to do. And so this place is filled with Davids and Joshua's and Caleb's. You know what? And God is rounding us up, amen? And we are going to see what is it that he's doing here in our city you know what, in our families, in our workplaces. But we'll only do that as we begin to rise up, know who our God is, and then just move forward in knowing that he is with us, just like David and Caleb and Joshua. We're going to do it the same way. And nothing new. It's the same, the same, same program. God constantly trying to rescue his people through his people. Amen? And we're part of that program. Amen? Happy Father's Day to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I that. Amen. Amen. Father, I call these people blessed. I call them healed from the top of their head to the bottom of their toes. I call them blessed of the Lord. I speak peace over their life. I thank you that they walk in joy and comfort as the Holy Spirit comforts them. I thank you, Father. Lastly, and as we've already committed, that we will be leaders in our, in our communities, in our circle of influence, in our families. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.